Hello, Redeemer. This is Pastor DeVoer. Today is Wednesday, March 25 of 2020. Uh, today is the second day of our governor's uh, call for people to stay at home to try to control the coronavirus. And so I had committed about a week ago and then repeated in my sermon last Sunday evening that I was going to do a video blog. So here we go. Um, there's really two reasons why I wanted to create a video blog. Uh, one is hmm, a little bit of a sad reason, and that is, frankly, I miss you all. And video and other forms of electronic communication are the way that we keep in touch. And so this is kind of one way, and that feels a little strange to me, but um, it is a way of communicating and catching up. So I'm going to do a little bit of talking, a little bit of teaching, and then a little bit of explanation about a few things that I hopefully that hopefully you'll find helpful. The second reason I wanted to do this was because I also said on Sunday evening for the little lambs that I was going to do a Herm of the Worm story, and my kids heard that at breakfast. Well, they heard that on Sunday and reminded me at breakfast that I better do a Herm of the Worm story and do it the right way. And so for all of you little lambs, just hang on. We'll get to Herm and the Worm, but Herm and the Worm will be at the end. So if you're wondering what I've been doing, um, I'm not in my office. Obviously, you can see I'm in my home office. Um, you might be wondering what I'm doing beside uh, preparing for sermons. Um, I do have more free time than usual. And so I've been working on a number of books, books that I had thought about reading in the past, but just didn't have the time. So not everybody has a lot of time, including me. And so I thought I'd show you a couple of these books, and I'll come back to them um, in later uh, video blogs. The one I want to talk about this morning first is a systematic theology. Let me put that up there. It's by Wayne Grudem. And this is a book that has been republished a couple of times or reprinted a couple of times. Uh, Wayne Grudem teaches at, I think he's still at TED's at Trinity Evangelical um, School in Deerfield, Illinois. Um, and there are a few places where I know that I might not agree with him. But this is one of the most helpful and most clearly written systematic the uh, theologies that I've read. And I want to go back and read through it again because, uh, as I'll explain just in a moment, there are a couple of good reasons for doing that. But some introductions to a couple of other books. Um, as you can kind of see from where I am, I don't know if you can see the bookmark there, but this is Charles Taylor's Secular Age. As some of you might be familiar with this. It's a cultural analysis and critique. Um, one of the best in the last 10 years. So I've read portions of this, but I wanted to go back and finish reading the parts that I had not. It's a pretty dense book, and so I thought I'd also show you this. This is by uh, James K.E. Smith, and I covered the title there, How Not to Be Secular, Reading Charles Taylor. Uh, James Smith teaches at Calvin College. He's there now, and this is sort of a condensing of a secular age, and uh, it's kind of a companion volume. If you're interested in reading cultural analysis, but wonder if I could get into it, it might be a little th dense, a little thick, so that would be helpful to you. And then the third book is called God and Soul Care by Eric Johnson. Um, this is a book about Christian psychology. I mean, you're not going to be able to see that because of the glare, but you'll take my word for it. God and Soul Care. So I've read portions of that as well, and I want to come back to uh, finish reading that. So it's a little bit ambitious. Each book's probably a thousand pages or more, um, but I'm going to see how far I can get. So back to Wayne Grudem, and um, yesterday I was reading, or rereading the introduction to a systematic theology, and he makes a couple of points um, that I wanted to um, suggest might be really valuable for you as you think about where we are and what we're doing both individually as a church and as a society as a whole. And he begins his systematic theology by talking about the definition. What is systematic theology? And the definition he gives is really characteristic of how the book reads as a whole. He says, many different definitions have been given, but for the purposes of this book, the following definition will be used. Systematic theology is any study that answers the question, what does the whole Bible teach us today about any given topic? Then he walks through that definition. It's a very accessible definition. And shortly after that, a few pages later, he talks about why Christians should study theology. And he then discusses this um, in probably half a dozen points or more. 
Um, and one of the most important explanations he gives or explains part of his definition, the, really the second thing he talks about is that it benefits our lives. Systematic theology is not just uh, something we do because we have the scriptures and we want to make sure we put all the teachings of the Bible in an orderly fashion. Um, he says the basic reason for studying systematic theology is that it is a means of obedience to our Lord's command and there are specific personal benefits to doing so. So he says, among other things, that studying systematic theology will help us grow as Christians. The, no, the more we know about God, about his word, and about his relationships to the world and mankind, the better we will trust him, the more fully we will praise him, and the more readily we will obey him. Studying systematic theology rightly will make us more mature Christians. If it does not do this, we are not studying in the way that God intends. I think that is really, really helpful. You might notice that on Sunday evenings in the series that I have been uh, 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 preaching called Basic Truths for Following Jesus, it's really a condensed systematic theology. We walk through questions about who is God, what is our sin, um, what is the scriptures. Now we're in the question, who is Jesus and what does it mean to be saved? And we're doing that um, using particular passages of Scripture, but drawing on the uh, a full teaching of Scripture, because systematic theology is designed to help us understand the big truths of the Word of God. And I thought I would show you the connection between that truth, a systematic theology, um, and its approach to, to understanding the Scriptures, and the benefit it gives us as Christians by looking at Mark chapter 8. Um, I want to read the first 10 verses or so. You can follow along, or you can just... Just listen if you want. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered, and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd, because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered them, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked him, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these should also be set before them, and they ate and were satisfied, and they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full, and there were about four thousand people, and he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district's the district of Dalmutha. So you might wonder, what does this have to do with systematic theology? Well, if we read through this passage, there are a number of things that uh, systematic theologians um, would draw on to prove specific doctrines. For example, it talks about the compassion of Jesus in verse 2. Well, this is one of the attributes of God, that he's a merciful God. So combining this with other passages like Psalm 90 or Psalm 103, we get a comprehensive picture of who God is. He's a compassionate God. He's merciful. He cares about who we are. The second thing you might draw on is where Jesus uh, instructs his disciples to take the seven loaves and, seven uh, and the two fishes and to divide them, and they divide them, and they multiply over and over and over again. You know, we might draw on this passage to talk about the sovereignty or the almighty power of God. That God has the power to take things that seem very limited in our minds and expand them and cause them to grow, to make them into something far more than we could imagine. This is nothing less than an almighty power. None of you are going to, for lunch, take one slice of bread and hope that it's going to feed a whole family simply by multiplying the bread there miraculously. That's not possible. But with God, not only has he made the entirety of the universe out of nothing in a marvelous, miraculous way, but we continue to see that he has the power to do things that are beyond our imaginations. And then the third thing that we might draw on is what this miraculous work of Jesus means about Jesus himself. This is one of the proofs of the deity of Jesus, that he is not just a human being, although people perceived him, he had human flesh. As I talked about on Sunday evening, he had the range of human emotion that we do. Uh, but he is more than just a human being. Jesus is God. And so if I'm a systematic theologian looking at this passage in comparison to other passage, I would say, well, look, here's a proof that Jesus is more than just a human being. Jesus is God himself. Now, having said all of that, there is direct application from those three doctrines to your circumstance, I'm guessing. Uh, because not only is God sovereign, but he is able to work in the situation in which we are right now, whatever that is. 
Some of you might be experiencing a loss of job. Man, I think about that a lot and pray for you. It's not easy to be out of work. All of a sudden you're at home and you have this feeling you want to be at work. You want to be productive using your talents, your abilities, and instead you're stuck at home. You might even find that family dynamics become more difficult. But in the middle of all of that, keep in mind that God is sovereign. He's at work. That your God is not absent, but he is in the middle of this. And combine that with what it talks about the compassion of Jesus, that he's someone who cares about you. And you have more than just a God who is at work and he is in control somewhere vaguely. But this is a God who's at work right here and right now in your home, in your life, even in these circumstances in which we find um, find ourselves. And then that third doctrine that Jesus is he's, 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 he's uh, divine, that is, he's God himself. Um, that is, I can't tell you how helpful that is in a moment like this, because he's not only compassionate and he's sovereign, he's divine. That is, he has the power of God himself to be at work. You know, a lot of times I'll tell myself when I'm in the middle of a situation, there are two basic truths, two basic truths in what it means to be a Christian. That is that uh, God is far more powerful than I can imagine. He is sovereign and he's at work. And God is a gracious God. He loves me and Jesus. And whatever you're facing today, whether it's just, it could be boredom. It could be <laughs> unusual family dynamics because you're all stuck at home together. It could be more serious. It could be a loss of a job and financial pressure. Um, know that God is with you. And the systematic theology that we love and we study is meant to lead you to trust and confidence in Jesus. So let me pray for us and then... Well, I guess before I go, I should tell a Herman the Worm story. Father, you are at work, and we thank you today that you have, the, have given us these words from the scriptures. We pray that you would help us not only to understand them and to believe them, but that you would give us sharp minds to connect them to other places in the word of God, that we would be, as Wayne Grudem commends to us, people who not only know systematic theology, but know how to connect the, those truths to our lives. I pray for my brothers and sisters, wherever they are this morning, Lord, would you be with them? Would you help them? Would you lift their spirits to see that you are a God who is totally in control and you love them more they can, than they can even imagine in Jesus? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so now on to Herman the Worm. I've got to say a little bit for parents and others who are watching. You don't have to watch if you don't want to. <laughs> but I promised the kids I do a Herman the Worm. Um, a little background on this. I started showing up at Little Lambs um, at church when their moms were having Bible study because I love to engage with people of all ages, including kids. And my mom, shout out to my mom, used to tell me Herman the Worm stories. And I did not realize until I started telling these stories to the um, little lambs that there were books, or there is at least one book written about Herman the Worm. I never read that book. I don't know anything about that book. And if what I'm doing is a discredit to the author who put together the great stories about Herman the Worm, theoretically, I mean, I don't know them. Uh, I am really sorry. <laughs> these are all made up. Um, my mom used to tell me these stories, um, and they were encouraging. These are not the same stories. They are along the same line. You might say they're in the same genre of Herman the Worm, if I can exalt Herman the Worm to that status. So in order to tell Herman the Worm stories, you have to sound like Herman. So in order to do that, I invite you to follow along with me. You got to take your tongue and stick it behind your bottom lip. And this is what Herman the Worm sounds like. Herman the Worm. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to tell you a Herman the Worm story for all the little lambs. I miss you. And I wish we were sitting in church doing this and your moms were studying the scriptures. I think everyone would prefer that. But this is what God has for us. So enjoy Herman the Worm. Herman the Worm was a very little worm. He was a worm who did not always listen to his mother and do what his mother said. But pretty soon the sun came out. Remember him in the worm during the winter time was stuck up in a tree because he was trying to get to the light and to the warmth? Do you remember he was stuck up in a tree and he was frozen there? Oh, it was terrible. But do you know that the sun is coming out? If you look outside, it's getting sunny and warm. So him and the worm started to thaw out. And him and the worm got warmer and warmer and warmer until one day, Herman wasn't frozen anymore. And he dropped from the tree down. <laughs> Boom! Until he landed on the ground. And him went, Mmm, it feels so good to be back on the ground. 
and he started to crawl around, finding a nice hole to go down to into the ditch. And as he was crawling around very, very slowly and carefully, he finally got to a place he thought this would make a good home. And as he was snuggling into the dirt, all of a sudden you heard a hmm? What was that? It was a shovel. It was a shovel. Someone was digging the dirt. And heaven, instead of having a nice warm dirt home to go into, was all of a sudden in a shovel of dirt being lifted higher and higher and higher. And so, thump, he ended up in a wheelbarrow. And then he went for a ride. Someone was pulling, pushing the wheelbarrow all over the yard. And him went this way and that way and this way and that way. Until finally, someone dumped the wheelbarrow right in a garden bed. And him and the worm went to live in a garden bed. You know whose garden bed that is? It's my garden bed. During this time that we've been uh, away from, from church, spending a lot of time at home, I started building a garden bed in the backyard. And when I was digging dirt to put dirt into my garden bed, guess who I found? Our friend Herman the Worm. Ah, so what happens to Herman the Worm in my garden bed? Good question, right? Well, you have to wait until next week to find that out. It's been great talking to you, everyone, both little lambs and the rest of you, Redeemer. Look forward to worshiping virtually with you on Sunday. If you have any questions about what's happening at church or any sort of anything else, please just send me a text, drop an email, give me a phone call, or you can even respond out to this crazy YouTube channel with a video blog. Love y'all. Bye.